So this is a middle-aged talk, and I think that's kind of appropriate because I'm a middle-aged guy. I teach Canadian studies, and increasingly when I look at my class and I talk to my students, I find myself talking about things that I never thought I'd talk about. There's a whole bunch of things, whether it's the continued racialization of groups of people in our society, whether it's sexual violence, whether it's the marginalization of people of poverty. And I think about the problems that my students are going to have to deal with because the people of my generation didn't deal with them. One of the things that I never thought I would be talking about at this point in time in my life is the merits of education, and in particular, the merits of an education in the liberal arts and humanities. Because when I was a student, when I was an undergraduate student, these merits seemed self-evident. In fact, they were so self-evident that we might have challenged them a little bit. So what I want to do, just a couple of proviso to begin, is a little bit of a confession because I feel a little bit like an imposter. I actually teach in an interdisciplinary program. So I teach with social science and the humanities and the arts and science and commerce and all kinds of things. I think we live in interesting times. I'm going to talk a little bit about the oddity of trying to defend the humanities and liberal arts, something, as I said, I never thought we'd have to do. And even though I'm talking now, what I really want to do is to invite you to become part of a conversation about the character and nature of post-secondary education and post-secondary education in the liberal arts and humanities. I'm going to approach this in four ways. I'm going to go through it in four steps. I want to talk a little bit about the challenges that education in the humanities faces today. I want to talk about what we know about education and the humanities. I want to talk about the value of it, and I want to think a little bit, speculate a little bit about how we can and should respond to the challenges. And those challenges are manifest. We've seen a shift in the educational demography of post-secondary education, of people moving away from taking courses in the humanities, in history, in literature, in, in music, in the arts, in philosophy, in religious studies, and a movement towards STEM disciplines. More involvement in experiential learning, and we're not always sure how that works in the humanities and liberal arts, and an increasing concern about labor market integration. What do I do after I go to your, your university? How do I move to a job? What's the path that takes me there? And will my degree in English or history or, or religious studies get me to that point? And I've got to say a couple of things about this. I don't actually mean to disagree or to slam or to reject those kinds of concerns. I'm a parent and I ask exactly the same things. Right? When my daughter takes courses, when she enrolls in programs, I ask, what are you going to do with that? Right? In part because, well, if she's been on the payroll for a while, I'd like to move her off. But also because we're concerned about the future of our kids. Likewise, the expansion of students taking STEM disciplines is not something to be rejected. It's not something that we should say we have a problem with this because a lot of that shift in educational demography is occurring because young women are going into the sciences, into technology, into engineering and math, and that's a good news story. So whereas those students may, 20 years ago, have been sitting more in my classes, that was a product of the character and nature of the way in which people thought about gender and education at the time. And those young women are being the best feminists that we can have because they are taking the autonomy that a generation of activists have created for them and they are using it. And we shouldn't shoot them down for it. More concerning to me are the changing perspectives of conservatives. And okay, we don't like conservatives. I don't like conservatives. I actually got in trouble in one of my classes a few years ago because I, we were doing sort of political leaders of Canada and I had Justin Trudeau and I had Jeremy Singh and I had Voldemort. So, <laughs> right? Right? what concerns me about conservatives is that conservatives used to be the leading defenders of the humanities. They used to be the leading defenders of the liberal arts. They would make the case for the value of that type of learning, that way of thinking, those texts. And we can disagree with some of the texts, and we can disagree with some of the argument, but today's conservatives don't make that argument. They make the argument that education 
in the arts, in the humanities, is a bunch of liberal claptrap. That it's intensely politicized. That asking you to think is somehow me imposing my views on you. That asking you to read a poem is somehow the rejection of established order. That suggesting that reading Thomas King is somehow a political plot to convince you to vote differently. And that's a concern when every type of education you can possibly imagine becomes politicized and we no longer read the text, we no longer think about what King meant, we no longer wonder about Maxine Times' poetry, but we simply, or there's a discourse that chalks it up. Equally important to me, something that we need to address is the way in which the humanities and liberal arts have been complicit in processes of colonization, in racialization, in sexism and marginalization. A good example of that is the way in which indigenous people for an extended period of time were written out of Canadian history. Canadian history began with explorers. And indigenous people were a bunch of savages who for unknown reasons tortured Jesuit missionaries. One caveat among many in this, many of these processes, and this is, this is publicly accessible data, you can find it, I can pass on references if you want, and you don't need to, to think, oh, I've got to like, look at all of this and remember all of this. I also want you to think about, I want you to, to convey the idea that these processes are uneven, that they proceed in different ways, at different paces, and have an odd regional unevenness in Canada but I also think they probably have an odd unevenness at different institutions and for different people. So bear that in mind, overarching generalizations are difficult to make. So how do we respond to some of the challenges when people talk about the problems or reasons why you shouldn't take certain courses in university? The first thing I say is that education is good for you. There's something I never thought I'd say publicly because I thought everybody knew it. Right? Education does a whole bunch of good things, and this is not just me making this up. These are things that we can actually empirically demonstrate, that we can show connections and correlations with. The higher your level of formal education, and I know there are all kinds of different types of education. We use formal education simply because it's the easiest to measure. You can look at the number of years versus different types of education. So just using it just as an example, not saying it's the only type of education, formal education, the higher your levels of formal education, the more likely you are to vote and be civically engaged. The more likely you are to, to volunteer in your community, to think of your community as home. The higher your level of formal education, the more likely you are to coach the minor basketball team, to be at the clean up the park day, to go to the concert at the Cenotaph, those kinds of things. We also know, and we'll have a chance to talk perhaps more about this later, that the higher your level of formal education, the higher your income. Now, there's a big qualification in this. There's a big gender division on that point. We do know that a young woman with a university degree has the same earning potential as a man with a two-year college diploma, right? So there's a, there's a distinction that we need to be involved, that we need to be aware of. And then finally, behavior. The higher your level of formal education, the more risk adverse you are, the more likely you are to obey the law, the less likely you are to commit a crime. And liberal education does really well. All education does well on these things. All education improves these things. But liberal education does particularly well. And it, again, this is publicly accessible. I'm not going to go through all of it. Just look at this line, for example. 73% of liberal arts majors strongly agreed that they had at least one professor who excited them about learning. That's the great merit of liberal education, that ability to reach out and to get people excited and to say, hey, do you want to go on this journey with me? Do you want to walk down this path? Do you want to engage in this conversation? And that's something that liberal arts education does in spades. Response number two. A lot of people, we've already talked about it, find the humanities, a lot of employers find the humanities produce exactly the type of skills that they are looking for. And report after report after report confirms this. If we look at the top kinds of skills that employers are looking for in today's workforce, we find there are things like collaboration, communication, 
problem solving, relationship building, the kinds of things that go on every day in a humanities-based classroom. And we find the other things, technical knowledge, for example, down the list. In terms of employment then, the types of competencies that are developed by a liberal arts education are precisely those competencies that are going to integrate people into the labor market. And here's a quote, same type of thing that illustrates the exact same point. The defining traits of top employers and top teams are not technical skills, but the very qualities developed in the humanities. Response number three. There is an intrinsic value to education, and this is a very difficult one to prove. There's an intrinsic value to education in the humanities and liberal arts, because it's not an empirical measure. It's very vague, and it's difficult to define. And so I talk about it this way. I ask the question, what would you wish for? If you were picking something for somebody else, what would you wish for them? If you were picking something for your friend or your child or a parent, what would you wish for them? Would you wish that they had read Maxine's po Maxine Tyne's poetry or not read Maxine Tyne's poetry? Would you wish that they had read Ellie Weissel's Night or not read Ellie Weissel's Night? Would you wish that they had heard Leonard Cohn's music, say Democracy in the USA, or not heard it? Or seen Carl Beam's paintings or Daphne Ojig's paintings? If you were picking for somebody else, would you expand their cultural horizons or lower their cultural horizons or leave them the same? And when we ask that kind of question, very few people I've ever talked to said, you know what? I want my children to know less history. I want them to know less ethics. I want them to know less about world religions. I want them to know less about the types of music and poetry and painting that animate society. Response number four comes from my talking to my students. One of the things, I teach one of those big lecture classes, Introduction to Canadian Studies course, and a lot of students use it for a humanities distribution credit. And I ask them, why are you in my class? You have lots of choice. There's other classes you can take. You have chosen to come and to sit in my class. You're gonna spend $800, a little bit more, to sit there, why? And there's a whole bunch of reasons why students sit in my class. Some of them sit in my class because it's two days a week, right? I had a young man ask me to override the cap. The course has a limit in the number of students on it. He explained to me he liked long weekends. I said, it's not really a good enough reason, sorry, right? A lot of people take the class because it's in a particular time slot. Right? Okay, I've got labs in the afternoon, I'll take your course in the morning, or I've got labs Tuesdays and Thursdays, and yours is Monday and Wednesday. And a lot of people take the course because, well, they just didn't know what it was, and they picked a, checked a little box on an online thing, and they ended up there. But a lot of people take the course for a whole bunch of other reasons. And when I ask students, why are you in my course? Right? Why are you here? What are you doing here? They talk about education in a way that defies the stark distinctions between STEM and the humanities, or between, say, commerce and the liberal arts, that occupy our heads, that affect the way we think, that we think of these things as different. My students don't seem to. One of the things my students say is, you know what, I'm a third-year psycholo third psychology major, I'm a third-year physics major, I'm a fourth-year biology major, and you know what, I'm really happy with my knowledge of psychology. I love taking physics courses. I feel really good about the commerce courses and commerce program I'm in. But what I don't know are the kind of things that you're gonna talk about in your class, and as I go to graduate, it occurs to me that these are some of the things that I probably should know about that they think on a continuum about public policy, about public expression, about civic engagement, about culture, about coaching, about athletics. So students see the humanities as part of an education of, that has a continuum of meaningfulness, not stark distinctions, and that combines things that are often counterposed against each other. What about colonialism? What about the qualifications? We do live after the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report. And this is an important consideration. 
As we talk about the vitality and importance of the humanities, of the liberal arts, of the creative and performing arts, we need to be very, very careful that we do not replicate the problems of the past, that we don't write history in ways that consign indigenous people to the dustbin, that we think about the character and nature of immigration history, that we have our students read about those things, that we have them think think about ethics across cultures. We need to be careful, in other words, that we don't use our justification of teaching the liberal arts and humanities as a way of ignoring, of silencing, of displacing the very voices that we need to embrace as we go forward. So where does this leave us? Well, it seems to me that it leaves us in multiple places. It leaves us with the need to further a conversation and I recognize that in the last year, in the last couple of years, there's been a lot of voices pushing back against the idea that what students should be studying is STEM or commerce or something like that. And I want to be part of those voices, not because I want to reject STEM and I want to reject commerce, because I want them to be part of the conversation about that continuum. I want to engage that subject and I want to invite you as we go to engage it too. So I think it leaves us, one of the places that it leaves us is a need to further and continue a conversation. Another place it leaves us is a need to ask questions. And one of those questions that we might ask is, how did we get to this place? What's gone on in our society? We can look at the political dynamics, we can look at the economic dynamics, we can look at the social and cultural dynamics. We might ask if we want to avoid the problems and pitfalls of the past, of the marginalization and racialization that infused the culture of Canada. We might ask, how did I, Andrew Nurse, a white, anglophone, middle-class man, get on this stage? Why am I here speaking to you and not somebody else? We might also ask, how do we broaden our teaching of the humanities? And a lot of people are doing this already. One of the things I love about the humanities are voices like Alfred's in Peace, Power, and Righteousness, right? Are, are, are the poetry of Maxine Tynes and the poetry of Rita Joe. The way in which David Adams Richards catalogs and explores the dynamics of poverty on the Miramichi. Or a film like Margaret's Museum asks us to think about what are the problems of toxic masculinity in the workplace and how does that become self-destructive. When I think about people like Marie Batiste or the late Richard Wagamese's Indian Horse, I see people from different perspectives, from different cultures, using the tools of the humanities to speak into our society. And that's the very conversation I'd like to ask you, invite you to participate in. Thank you.